Hello and welcome back to Interpreting India. 2021 has been defined by a deadly pandemic, precarious geopolitical relations, a sharply contracting economy, and a rapidly evolving technological landscape. This season, we at Carnegie India are examining many of the challenges and opportunities that India will confront in the coming decade. I'm your host, Anirudh Burman, and this week, we are analyzing whether the existing law on patents is affecting India's ability to vaccinate its citizens. As India battles a devastating second wave of COVID-19, the Biden administration in the USA announced its support for the proposal to waive TRIPS obligations on coronavirus vaccines. The proposal to do so was first brought before the WTO in October 20 by India and South Africa, and is now supported by 62 WTO members. Supporters of the proposal claim that if the WTO agrees to this proposal, vaccine production will experience a marked increase, leading to faster vaccinations and fewer deaths. However, others have opposed this move, claiming that this would impede innovation and is not the right solution to increasing vaccine production. In today's episode, we aim to understand the economic logic behind the proposal for the TRIPS waiver. How will it potentially impact global vaccine stocks? Will vaccine production increase if intellectual property rights are suspended? Will more manufacturers start producing COVID-19 vaccines once a waiver is granted? And will it lead to faster vaccinations for India and many other developing countries? In this episode of Interpreting India, Professor Alex Tabarok joins us to discuss the TRIPS waiver. Professor Alex Tabarok is Bartley J. Madden Chair in Economics at the Mercatus Center and a Professor of Economics at George Mason University. He is the co-author of the popular economics blog Marginal Revolution and co-founder of Marginal Revolution University. He is the author of numerous academic papers in the fields of law and economics, criminology, regulatory policy, voting theory, and other areas in political economy. He is co-author with Tyler Cohen of Modern Principles of Economics, a widely used introductory textbook. He has written recently on the issue of patents and vaccines, and in March this year, his co-authored paper on market design to accelerate COVID-19 vaccine supply was published in Science Magazine. Great to be here. So let's start with a bit of background to this issue of the TRIPS waiver and its implications for vaccine manufacturing. In the past year, we've seen some of the fastest ever development of vaccines and their rollout has been at an unprecedented scale in human history. And even as COVID-19 is continuing to ravage populations and much more needs to be done, Many countries are also vaccinating their populations at a very fast rate. So could you talk to us a little bit about what factors have enabled vaccine production and distribution at this pace? Yeah. So uh, someone over a year ago, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Michael Creamer and I, uh, were asked to write a report for the U.S. government, for the Domestic Policy Council, on how to accelerate vaccines using incentives. And joined by a number of other top economists, we did that. And our main uh, point was the following. We said that we need to incentivize the vaccine manufacturers to start building their factories now before a vaccine is approved. Now, usually a vaccine manufacturer, they're not going to start building a factory until after the vaccine is approved because they don't know when they're researching and developing the vaccine. They don't know if it's going to be successful. They don't know if it's ever going to be approved, so they're much better off just waiting. And we said, look, there isn't time for this. In this emergency, we need to incentivize building the capacity now, even if the va that vaccine is never approved, it's a worthwhile bet to, to place. We want to have lots of shots on goal. And that's essentially what Operation Warp Speed in the United States did. They paid for a lot of uh, the clinical trials. They paid for to build the factories. They paid to get the Moderna vaccine up and running. They paid for advanced purchases for the Pfizer vaccine. So a lot of money was put into vaccines before we even knew that any of them would be uh, successful. And that has enabled us to... Uh, start vaccinating much earlier than we usually would. Now, we said we should be investing on a world scale like 150 billion, and Operation Warp Speed was maybe 15 billion. There was a few billion from the British, a few billion from the Europeans. So the world did not go as big as we wanted, um, and that's why today we don't have as much capacity as we would like. 
But the capacity that we did build has been very, very valuable. Right. And once a lot of this money was deployed, what were the companies doing at their end? How were they actually managing the logistics of scaling up manufacturing? What have they actually done to make sure that they have the supply chains in place, that all the raw materials are there? What's been the action like on their side? So it's really been a pretty amazing process. Keep in mind that for the mRNA vaccines in particular, for Pfizer and uh, Moderna, these types of vaccines have never been uh, produced at scale ever before. So not only did Pfizer and Moderna had to develop, had to scientifically develop a vaccine, which was actually the shortest part of the, pro- of the project, that, that was quite quick, but they actually had to produce for the very first time factories capable of producing this kind of vaccine. And uh, both Pfizer and Moderna have done extremely well at that. And they're learning a lot as we go along. So this is an entirely new process. So for example, Pfizer uh, and Moderna both initially thought they would require a lot of cold storage. And uh, now it's looking like we don't need as much cold storage as they initially thought. And that's going to allow these vaccines to be uh, distributed even more widely than we had previously imagined. So there's a lot of learning by doing as we go along. Um, And it's not just Pfizer and Moderna, uh, AstraZeneca and the Serum Institute uh, in India uh, have uh, ramped up uh, production. Um, So given the constraints that we have, um, we are producing a lot of vaccine. We wish, you know, looking backwards now, uh, I think it's clear we should have invested more, but uh, we're going to be producing more vaccine than has ever been done in the world before. Right. And uh, so here, why is there a clamor for waiving TRIPS obligations or patent protections for vaccine production if we are producing at a scale that's unprecedented? And how does that actually link to the current shortfall in uh, vaccines for countries like India? Yeah, it really doesn't because the constraints on production right now are that we don't have the capacity and we're running out of raw materials, and there's also human capital. So uh, for the mRNA vaccines in particular, there might be like 500, maybe 1,000 people in the world who know how to produce these vaccines. And as I mentioned, they're still learning how to do it. So they've been able to increase production uh, quite a bit just by uh, tinkering with the process. There's a lot of learning by doing, but this is entirely new. And there is no mRNA capacity. There's no idle factories, right? So getting rid of patents is is really not uh, going to increase production uh, at all. Um, You know, plastic bags, which they use in the bioreactors, are a bigger constraint on production than our patents. So the whole issue of patents, I think, is a distraction and uh, it's, it's not helpful. So why did this proposal come about? Uh, India and South Africa were the countries that initially proposed this at the WTO. And India is also one of the largest vaccine manufacturers in the world. So it's not it's not a question of capacity, clearly. So why do you think they actually raised this issue at the WTO? So I think the most charitable interpretation is that they're confusing the situation with the AIDS crisis of the 1990s. So with the AIDS crisis the AIDS drugs were incredibly expensive. So the AIDS drugs were priced at $10,000 to $15,000 a year, which was well above their cost of production. So in the case of the AIDS drugs, there was an issue that of monopoly pricing. And you know this created the tension between creating incentives to uh, innovate and allowing the drugs to be distributed as widely as possible. And so in that case, there was at least an argument, maybe not a totally compelling argument, but an argument to uh, cut into the patents to lower the prices to allow these drugs to be more widely distributed. Now, the vaccines are completely different than the AIDS drugs. The vaccines, to begin with, are dirt cheap. So for the vaccines, we're talking about not ten dollars to $15,000 a year. We're talking about $10 to $50, you know, once, you know, maybe twice if you need a booster shot, right? So the vaccines are already dirt cheap. Uh, In fact, while there were lots of countries which could not afford AIDS drugs, 
There's no country which cannot afford vaccines. In fact, I would go further and say that there is no country which can afford not to invest in vaccines because by investing in vaccines, you are getting the economy going again. Uh, you are increasing economic growth. So the vaccines basically pay for themselves many times over. Even in a relatively poor country like India, the value of the vaccines in terms of economic growth, in terms of increasing GDP, is much higher than the price. So India should not be worried about the price of the vaccines um, because they're going to repay, uh, not just in lives saved, but in terms of economic growth. Paying for the vaccines is it's a no brainer. It's uh, what I, uh, I call the world's easiest cost benefit test, since the benefits of the vaccines are so much higher than the costs. So I think while the patent issue, there were some cases for it with the AIDS drugs, uh, it's not, that's not what's going on today with the vaccines. There's no, uh, there's no monopoly pricing really going on. The prices are really quite, quite low. Right. So just on the question of uh, benefits, uh, one of your uh, recent papers, you argued in a uh, recent paper in Science Magazine that investing in accelerating vaccines can pay for itself many times over from reduced fiscal costs alone. And this struck me because one of the issues that we've been dealing with in India is the issue of whether we have the fiscal space to make greater investments in vaccine production. So could you just explain the statement a little bit more? Yeah. So what COVID is doing is reducing GDP, right? So COVID is not not simply just by, you know, uh, healthcare costs, which are uh, large, or, or deaths, which are, you know, very uh, costly. But COVID makes it, people are fearful. They're fearful of going out. They're fearful of, you know, going to restaurants. They're fearful of going to work, um, fearful of large gatherings and so forth. So COVID is reducing uh, the world's GDP. And when you have the vaccines, then the economy rebounds. This is what we're seeing in the United States right now. This is what we've seen in Great Britain and in Israel as they have vaccinated. The economy rebounds tremendously. So the small price to pay for the vaccines, you know, 40 or $50 at the, at the most, that is more than repaid by the increase in GDP. And in fact, it can even be the case that the tax revenues are higher once uh, you pay for the vaccines because uh, GDP goes up and tax revenues uh, go up. So I think one mistake which uh, India made is in not investing more with the Serum Institute early on and also in not allowing the Pfizer vaccine uh, into India, not approving the Pfizer vaccine. Um, other countries made these mistakes as well. Uh, you know, Europe dickered over the price. And that really was a mistake. You know, while they were wasting time, you know, looking for change in the back of the uh, car seat, you know, the car was going over the cliff. This was not a sensible thing to do. So every country really needs to uh, invest in getting the vaccines produced and getting them delivered uh, to people all over the country. And on the issue of investing, there's also the question of how much time it would actually take to start a facility and scale up production. Now, uh, and some people have argued that even if you were to make that investment today, it would still take some time for production to actually start and for that vaccine to reach the market. Is that a fair argument? Sure. I mean, is that that's true. But that, of course, that's why, you know, uh, Michael Creamer and I and our team were advocating going big, you know, a year ago, a uh, year and a half ago. Um, and we wanted every country to invest much more than they actually did. So, but it's not too late. It's, I mean, it's not too late to do more. Um, you know, if you invest now, then you're going to be better off six months from now, right? Yes, it does. It does take time. Now, some of, some of the time you can uh, recapture by investing more. So it's going to be more expensive. You know, it's more expensive to invest now than it would have been to uh, invest a year ago. Um, but that expense is worth paying. And India should also do things like immediately approve um, all of the vaccines really which are available, particularly the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. There's going to be capacity 
uh, coming online uh, for those vaccines because the United States got all of Moderna's vaccine um, uh, to begin with, and they got a lot of the Pfizer vaccine. But now in the United States, we've reached a point where we're almost saturated with vaccines. Um, it's very easy right now for anybody to get a vaccine. And our problem in the United States is vaccine hesitancy. Some people are worried about getting the vaccine. The, the Republicans think, you know, it's, it's not good or whatever. Um, this is a mistake. But our problem is not enough people getting the vaccine. But that supply is now going to be available for the rest of the world. And we hope um, uh, other vaccines like the Novavax vaccine will also start uh, in, in production as well. So uh, India needs to take advantage of this and uh, approve as many of the good vaccines as possible. So to come back to the issue of the TRIPS waiver, and uh, I think I agree with you on the point that it would actually, it's a bit, it's a bit of a distraction in terms of adding capacity in the short run. However, there is a point some others have made that it would probably exponentially add capacity over the medium to longer term. And if the virus stays with her for the next two to three years, in that case, does the waiver actually help in increasing production more than the current intellectual property framework? Probably not. Um, you know, the re so the vaccine manufacturers, uh, this is a situation in which licensing works quite well. So the vaccine mm -hmm. manufacturers are quite willing to license and also, this is really quite competitive. Um, there's lots of vaccines which are available. You know, there's the, mm. the Pfizer, the Moderna, the Johnson & Johnson, the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Russian vaccines, the Chinese vaccines. So actually, there's quite a bit of competition uh, out there. And uh, the, the companies want to produce as much as possible right now. So I'm not particularly worried about uh, IP. Right. Uh, so what are some of the other bottlenecks to scaling up vaccine production other than in just investment in capacity? Uh, my colleagues in Carnegie India, for example, have written about supply chain issues and regulatory issues, particularly the U.S. Defense Production Act that's uh, impeding some of the flows of raw materials required to make these vaccines to India. So do you think the resolution of these issues is key to increasing vaccine production in India or are there other workarounds to these two? Yeah, I mean, the United States should immediately lift the Defense Production uh, Act and enable resources to flow more uh, easily. I think that has been one issue, particularly getting supplies for the Novavax uh, vaccine uh, that uh, the Serum Institute uh, needed. Um, the United States now is really in very good positions uh, we, we have plenty of vaccine, so it is time to lift the Defense Production Act. Um, each of the vaccines requires thousands of different, uh, inputs, some of which are, you know, quite unique. So the Novavax vaccine, for example, uses, uh, Ch Chilean, uh, uh, soap bark the bark from the Chilean soap tree, which I don't really know a lot about, um, but that goes into the adjuvant. And uh, it just takes time to grow these trees and it takes time to get, the, uh, to get this bark. Now, again, if we invested more, you know, we could increase production. Um, and so I think both of these things are necessary. And you need to think along the entire supply chain. So it's not just investing in the final factory, but you need to invest in the producers of the bioreactor bags, the plastic bags. You know, as I said, uh, plastic bags are a bigger constraint on production than IP right now than patents. So you need to invest in producing the plastic bags. You need to invest in producing the bioreactors, the adjuvants, the needles, right? The vials, the fill and finish. It is a, an entire supply chain. Right. And I want to move from that to talking a little bit about India's recent policy shift in vaccine procurement. And over the last month, month and a half, the central government has basically decentralized vaccine procurement and asked states to procure vaccines for uh, specific sections of society, uh, in particular, the 18 to 44 age group. And 
uh, in one sense, it's opened up the market for procuring vaccines and allowed states the flexibility to go ahead and purchase vaccines on their own. On the other hand, we are now seeing issues where vaccine manufacturers are telling states that they would prefer to negotiate directly only with the center and not the states. So could you give your thoughts on what is this, uh, on what this vaccine procurement policy means for India and for the pace of vaccination in the country? So I think it's a complicated uh, issue. One problem I think is that the the Indian federal system is not that decentralized. Not It's not that federal uh, because the central government just has so much of the revenues and so much of the uh, power that uh, uh, you really need the central government to take an active role. Now, having said that, um, I think there is a case for uh, federalism for the state governments also taking a role. So I think it shouldn't be a case of one or the other, but both. Um, and I also think that private um, firms can take a role here. So the multinationals could start to vaccinate their workforces, for example. Um, there's also a lot of rich people uh, in uh, India. Um, you know, proportionally, uh, it, it, India is a relatively poor uh, a country, but there's lots of rich people in India because there's a billion people. It's more than a billion people in India. A lot of them are quite wealthy, right? Uh, uh, millions of them. So these should be able to buy on the open market uh, one of the more expensive uh, vaccines. So I would uh, open up, um, uh, allow purchases of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines by private firms, by private individuals, as well as uh, investing in the Serum Institute vaccines and providing them free for, for everybody, um, I would also allow purchases. Right. And I think related to this issue is the whole debate on vaccine equity versus vaccine efficiency. And a lot of people in India are making the case that even the existing price points of vaccines are unaffordable for many sections of the population. And one of their criticisms at this directed at this new policy is that this might actually make vaccines unaffordable and therefore slow down the pace of vaccination for the poorer segment of the population. Do you have any thoughts on this? Look, the government should buy as much vaccine as they possibly can and distribute it for free. Um, and maybe that's going to be the Novavax. Maybe that's going to be the uh, COVID shield or one of the other vaccines. Um, so maybe India doesn't want to distribute Moderna and Pfizer for free because it's a little bit more expensive. But private firms should be able to do that. And private individuals should be able to buy those uh, on the market. Now, keep in mind that every person who is vaccinated benefits everybody else because you're reducing transmission. So this is a case where there isn't really a big equity efficiency trade-off because when rich people get the vaccine, that also benefits poor people uh, because they're less likely to transmit and vice versa. So this really is a case where everybody is in this uh, together and you just simply need to go on all margins, vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. Poor people, rich people, middle class people, vaccinate them all as quickly as possible. You know, don't worry so much about the ordering. Uh, you know, there is a case for, you know, going to the elderly first. Uh, that's important. But don't worry about poor versus rich. Just get as many people vaccinated as possible. That's really the bottom line here. And I want to move away from this discussion to a point about the underlying causes for uh, proposals like uh, waiving of TRIPS obligations. And I think one of the underlying problems that animates this claim is that uh, we see that private pharma companies tend to underinvest in vaccine research and manufacturing. And a lot of people then argue that vaccines should be subject to a different kind of IP regime. In addition, there should be price controls and so on and so forth. Uh, what is the economic case for vaccine production that actually causes firms to underinvest in them? And is there a way to solve for this in the longer term? Right. I think it's correct that there is underinvestment in uh, vaccines. In fact, I also think there's underinvestment in pharmaceuticals um, more generally, that they have very high social value, even relative to private value. But yes, there's a big incentive. There's a big underinvestment. And the reason is this, is that 
The vaccine manufacturers only capture a small share of the value of the vaccines. So we saw in the United States, for example, that anytime there was any good news about the clinical trials, the entire stock market jumped up. So, of course, mm-hmm. the price of Moderna jumped up, but so did the price of General Electric. So did the price of the airline companies, right? Now, Moderna and Pfizer, they don't capture all of that gain, right? So the reason the you know airline stocks are going up is that, well, if people are vaccinated, they'll start flying again. But Moderna and Pfizer only capture a small share of that. So what you really want to do is not decrease the returns to the vaccine manufacturers, but increase them. Uh, Either that, you want to increase their profits. Their profits are too low. It's not that their profits are too high. The profits of the vaccine manufacturers are too low. So you either want to increase their profits, giving them more incentive to produce uh, vaccines, or you want to cut their costs, which is uh, essentially what Operation Warp Speed did. Operation Warp Seed, we're going to said, we're going to pay for the clinical trials. We're going to pay, we're going to subsidize your factories. Um, so that's another thing that, that one can do. Um, but getting rid of patents doesn't really, doesn't really help because uh, uh, if anything, that reduces the incentive to produce the vaccine in the first place. Um, I'll just give one more point, and that is this idea which uh, Michael Creamer, a Nobel Prize winner, has offered. He says... You should buy out the patent. Uh, And the nice thing about this idea of buying out patents, where the government pays for the patent, is that you don't face this trade-off between innovation incentives and distribution incentives. Because you're buying out the patent, the pharmaceutical companies still have lots of incentive to innovate. And then you buy out the patent, the government rips it up and says any generic producer can start producing. So then prices, you get a competitive pricing, prices fall to costs, to marginal cost, and you get widespread distribution. So buying out patents can maintain or even increase your innovation incentives while at the same time allowing widespread distribution at low price. That's really interesting. But uh, how does this actually compare to compulsory licensing? What's the difference? Well, compulsory licensing is... It's fine if the vaccine manufacturers, you know, suppose this compulsory licensing is supposed to include a uh, a payment, it's supposed to include a a payment, and if the payment is large enough, it's fine. But then why is it compulsory, right? Hmm. Uh, the vaccine manufacturers are quite willing to do licensing as long as it's profitable, um, which often it will be. Um, if you just have compulsory licensing, then you're reducing quite likely you're reducing the incentives of the vaccine manufacturers to produce in the first place. So rather than compulsory licensing, that's why I think a patent buyout is actually a better idea. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's quite interesting. Uh, On this uh, topic more generally, you've written on the need to have a better fit between patent law and patent theory. And could you talk a little bit about how we should be thinking about this uh, in terms of the current situation, but also more generally? Yeah, that's right. So oddly enough, I'm actually known as someone who is uh, skeptical of uh, patents and uh, IP. And yet I found in this situation that I've been uh, in favor of patents. And there is a reason for that, is that the best case for patents is when the innovation costs are high relative to imitation costs. And the best case for that is pharmaceuticals, because in pharmaceuticals, the first pill costs a billion dollars. That's your research and development costs. The second pill costs 50 cents. That's your imitation costs, your production costs. Now, if you were to allow any generic producer to come in and start producing at 50 cents a pill, that means that the innovator doesn't earn enough money to recoup their cost of development. So you don't get the innovation in the first place. So the case for patents is really quite strong for pharmaceuticals. Although then it, when the pharmaceutical is good and it works well, then you're going to create this tension because now you have the drug and the price is high. So you need to do something like a patent buyout or a compulsory license or something like that. Um, now for other goods where the innovation costs are much lower, they're closer to imi- imitation costs, like for software, 
I don't think there's a, a strong case for patents for software at all, right? Because for software, your imitation cost to, to write the software is almost as high as your innovation costs, right? So uh, patents for software really, really don't make a lot of sense. And there's a lot of other products where you say, do you really need a 20-year patent, you know, to protect this idea? Um, unless your innovation costs are really, really high, I think a 20-year patent is overkill. So I would like to see kind of a more nuanced patent system where we have, you know, a 20-year patent for, say, pharmaceuticals, a 10-year patent uh, if your innovation costs are lower, and then, you know, a two- or three-year patent, you know, for software or something like that, if you patent it at all. So in a sense, you're arguing for a more tailored approach to uh, parent law in terms of what industries and what kinds of innovations it applies to. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, ideally we would um, tie uh, the patent and the, the length and the breadth of the patent to your uh, cost of innovation. If you're spending a lot on R&D, then you get a longer patent uh, in order to recoup your, your costs. And you have to do some averaging over different firms and you have to collect the data and the data is not perfect. But, you know, we give tax breaks for uh, R&D. And so I think it would not be impossible to have a patent system, which was, as you said, more closely tailored to the R&D costs of the average firm in the industry. Right. Uh, thank you for that. And before we conclude, I have one last question to you. And that's, this is to place a hypothetical uh, what if we actually got a waiver for uh, patents for uh, vaccines, for COVID-19 vaccines? How do you think the market for COVID-19 vaccines would play out in that scenario? Would there be an actual increase of firms who manufacture these across both developed and developing jurisdictions? Or would the market actually get skewed because of too much competition, too much fight over raw materials and other issues? Yeah, I don't think it would make much difference, uh, actually. For the uh, mRNA vaccines, there is no idle capacity anywhere in the world. Uh, and look, here, here, here's an indication. China has not started to produce mRNA vaccines. Why not? Hmm. Is, is China worried about violating uh, patent law? You know, violating IV? No, China's not worried about violating someone's IV. It's because they can't do it. Because the technology is too new. Is too new. They don't know how to do it. Now, that's going to change probably within, you know, six months or so. Uh, we will see uh, some uh, additional mRNA vaccines. It will change. But right now, the constraint is not uh, IP. And so I think, you know, waiving the patent, it, it just won't really do do much of anything, uh, really. It, it, it's not going to... It's not going to be terribly bad for Pfizer and Moderna because they still have the technology and the know-how, but it is a bad uh, signal. It's a bad sign. Um, after all, these firms, the vaccine manufacturers, are the ones who are saving our lives, okay? Uh, so I think we want to send the message that when you innovate, you're going to be rewarded. We want to send the message not just for this crisis, but for the next one, that innovation in medical care, uh, innovation in pharmaceuticals, innovation in vaccines, that's something that we want. That's something to be rewarded. You know, instead, you know, uh, at our Punwala is having to flee India, right? You know, because uh, he's worried about his safety. And, uh, and, and people are talking about taking away, you know, the IP rights of Pfizer and Moderna. That's not very grateful, right? Uh, and I think it's not very smart, but it's also, it, it, it's also kind of sad that we don't reward the uh, very people who have done the most to save us from this crisis. Absolutely. And I think the message of regulatory certainty and rewarding innovation needs to be even clearer if we if we take the op pessimistic uh, assumption that this pandemic is going to last for a while. But this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Thank you, Professor Tabarok. Thank you for having me. Next time, my colleague Shibani Mehta will host an episode that aims to understand the current state of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and India's role within it. We will be back in two weeks with a new episode. To make sure you don't miss it, 
be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about our research and team, you can visit us at carnegieindia.org. You can also find us on social media on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you for listening. See you next time.